welcome. Good to see you all. Pat and Al, and I'm not sure who.
I just had a few announcements. Um, also, before we sing that, we'll uh, have a time for some testimony. So if the Lord's done something in your life this week, if you've read something in the Word, that would be especially helpful to your brothers and sisters. Uh, something that the Lord did for you, that you can encourage your brothers and sisters with in faith, then we'd love to hear about that. Um, so just remember, this coming Wednesday, we're in Titus, 6 o'clock here at the church, we'll live stream it as well, but uh, we'll be here for prayer meeting and Bible study. Uh, remember to pray for the Mansells this week, Ken and Vicki Mansell, missionaries to Japan, though they're not in Japan right now. They're heading back there, hopefully, Lord willing, at the end of August. That's their hope. Their last prayer letter said that they were hoping to be there in March. <laughs> so, no, it's not, not the way it works. So, um, but pray for them if you would this week. And then uh, next Sunday, we're having our church picnic, and we're not having evening service next Sunday uh, evening. So just to be aware of those things. If I could have our ushers come and uh, take up an offering, I don't know if anybody has anything, but just to give you the opportunity to do that. Um, so, guys? Yeah, no, that's fine. All right. Thank you, Lord, for... The goodness you've shown to us, Lord, the ways that you have blessed us, not just uh, spiritually, but Lord, materially. And we know that uh, blessings materially don't necessarily mean your favor, but Lord, we're thankful anyway for the material blessings you give. And we're asking, Lord, that as uh, folks here and online have uh, voluntarily, willingly, lovingly given of themselves to support you, uh, your work, and, uh, and to show their Praise and honor to you, Lord, that you bless those who did. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you have a free tribulational rapture, it just means that you think that we deserve to avoid every pain. And I'm like, well, that, that would be nice, obviously. Yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? But 
that's not why I believe in a pre-tribulational rapture. I, I believe that there's all kinds of things that we could go through, but oh, yeah. the, the very worst part, which is the wrath of God, which we'll look at tonight, we're going to, Christians, believers, are going to be spared from that. Right. You know? yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, and it's not wishful thinking. Though I wish it were true, that doesn't make it true. Uh, if the Bible said we have to go through the entire seven-year tribulation, I would say, well, don't I wish it was pre-tribulational, but I don't believe it. <laughs> so, yeah. Exactly. so, yeah. But, yeah, but it's, it's striking to think about all that Christians have suffered through throughout the years. Yeah. And uh, just they, these things that we talked about this morning were in their minds too. To watch, be ready, and uh, to pray. Be on high alert. Be on high alert, yeah. Yep. Good. Anybody else? Yeah, Marlene. Tonight, I have to say to all of you, thank you very, very much for including me in your prayers while I had my surgery. Yeah. And the good Lord has filled me with the strength I have today. He has been with me every inch of the way, so I never had to have chemo or radiation therapy. Amen. And look at me now. Amen. Amen. God is good. good. Amen. 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 Anybody else? Yeah, Terry. Well, but I'm thankful for the rain because we really needed it. Yeah. It needs to keep up the rain. That's right. Yeah. 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 Anybody else? All right. Well, let's sing again one last song number 200. Excuse me, 600. 13, Trusting Jesus, number 613. You can stay seated uh, as we sing number 613, Trusting Jesus.
let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at what we're going to talk about tonight. The issue, uh, this is going to be an overview, and I'll explain what we're doing in relation to what we have done already in the last two weeks. This is a, this is a concentrated class, I guess. We talk about preaching and teaching. This has definitely been teaching the last three weeks, but um, it's, it's not something I, th I think that I've ever covered here. Most of you then have gotten this information from someone else at some point. Some other preacher, teacher at some point went through this. And so some of this is a good reminder, but some of you, you're hearing it for the first time, maybe. And so um, I'd like to go deeper. At some point, there was some lobbying for turning this into uh, a series. And I just, I just, this is, it would take a lot more work. This is an overview is something I could do uh, a lot easier than digging into the nitty gritty and asking the hard questions. And you say, well, you don't have to do it that much, but I do. That's just the way I am. So <laughs> you can ask Amy. It's, it's not, I can't do it any other way. So, which is a real pain sometimes, not for her, but for me. So, um, anyway, just, uh, just pray for me if you would, and we'll, we'll, uh, uh, look forward to spending time tonight learning about some end times things. Lord, uh, thank you for what you have revealed. Lord, we know that the things that are revealed belong to us, that the secret things belong to you. Lord, there are many more secrets that you have that you have chosen not to tell us. And so, Lord, thank you for what you have revealed to us. Thank you that we can have these things uh, in a way that we can understand them and in a way, Lord, that we can, whether we understand them or not, be ready so, Lord, let what we learn about tonight be something that's edifying and encouraging, not panic-inducing, not something that would cause fear. But, uh, Lord, as we look at this tonight, we pray your help um, in our understanding, please. And we ask it in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so throughout the weeks, we started with, again, I don't know where happened to... Yeah, so this got all mixed, mixed up in order. I'm going to just click through until we're there. We started with, again, the eternal state um, and, and where, what's before that, what biblically is before that, the judgment. What's biblically before that, we said the reign of Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ, which is literal. Before that is the return of Christ. Before that, we believe, is the tribulation. And before that is the rapture, coming from a pre-tribulational, pre-millennial position. Now, of course, this is confusing because it makes it seem like this is the way our Western brains think, that this is what's first, and that's what's last. And that's, oh, this is really, let me just help you guys out here. There, is that a little better? There, okay. CDO, right, Evan? Um, it's actually it's more like this, right? The next thing we're waiting for is the rapture. It's imminent. It, we, it could happen at any moment. We don't, there's nothing that has to happen first. Then the tribulation. Then the return of Christ. Then the reign of Christ. Then the judgment. Then the eternal state. Now again, there's a reason I went backwards. Because no one can test that we're going to be in eternal state. So let's start with the obvious. Let's start with the thing that everybody knows and work back from there. But having established all that the last two weeks, now we're going to start going forward. And what I'm going to do is an overview. Now, this is called pre-tribulational, premillennial position, or it's sometimes called dispensational premillennialism. Okay? Just to introduce other words. Okay? So the question then is, what is... So this is premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism. Again, just what we talked about already. The church age, what we're in right now, the... The dead in Christ, and there's a debate about the Old Testament saints, are raised at the rapture. Uh, the seven years of tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, uh, Christ returns. And, uh, and then the battle of Armageddon. And again, in this model, the tribulation saints and the Old Testament believers are raised. The dead in Christ uh, is at the rapture. Everyone else there. The millennial reign of Christ, Satan's loosed. The judgment of the wicked and the eternal state. So that generally, again, with a, a few little minor differences between believers, that's generally what premillennialism is. So what is dispensationalism? This is a, um, an old chart Larkin. by Larkin. You knew it, yes. 
Okay, so some of you have seen this chart before. Maybe it's even in your Bible. I don't know. Some of you may have it painted on a mural at home. You know, big ten foot. I don't, no, okay. Uh, uh, I have. I have actually seen people have have done that. And the idea was that if they're raptured, then somebody coming into their home would have an idea of what's happening next. And I guess that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I've never seen. Right. Yeah. So. So anyway, this is this is again. An interpretation, and I don't even know how well those of you online can see it. Obviously, those sitting here, it's pretty hard to make out. Um, but this is something you can find on eSword for free. You can probably find it online or in some books. But just to generally let me go through this, um, again, uh, the idea of dispensationalism, and again, he calls it rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, I don't like that phrase because of the connotation Obviously, it's a Bible phrase, but the connotation that it now has is, you know, you have to only go with what age we're in, and we're only in Paul's epistles age, so only Paul's epistles are relevant for today, which I don't believe. So I do believe in rightly dividing the word, and I do believe in what we're going to talk about, but I don't believe only Paul, right? Okay, so what this is, is basically, it's an idea, and it's an idea, so it's man's idea, but it's man's idea that... Um, God has worked at different times in different ages throughout human history. And so we start with um, creation, and then it goes into, this is the flood, and then we go into different ages. And again, it's really, really hard to see. So I apologize for this. Let me see if I... Okay, nope. Um, so that... The, this is hard to say. Uh, the first circle there is... Uh, did I write it down? Yeah. The idea... Okay, let me... Let me I'm, I'm sorry about this. this I, I, I thought I had written this down, and I just put this up here to kind of talk about it. But I sent, uh, let, me just, let me just summarize, because I'm not necessarily... This isn't a, the point, but dispensationalism believes that God has worked... Uh, his grace in different ways throughout time, okay? The word dispense is in dispensationalism. How has God dispensed his grace, okay? And so in different ways, uh, meaning this, did God act differently and have different expectations for Abraham than he did for David than he did for Paul? And the answer obviously is yes, in a way, right? David didn't know anything about Jesus. I mean, he knew a little bit because he wrote about him, right? Psalm 22 and Psalm 69 and other places. But he didn't know that Christ was going to die on the cross and his blood was the atoning work and everything like that. He didn't know anything about that. Abraham didn't know anything about the Mosaic Law. Uh, Noah didn't know anything about any of the things that were going to happen before that. Noah wasn't in the line of Abraham. Abraham was in the line of Noah. So... There's a, so how did God deal with different people through different times? And, and this chart, or something like it, tries to explain that in some ways. And so the first circle is uh, man. Let's see. No, I'm not going to be able to do it. The first circle is man, then the flood, and then that circle is, again, the big circle that the two circles are in is the antediluvian age, meaning before the flood. Then there's the flood there in the middle, and then we have the law of government. This is... The Tower of Babel, God told them to govern themselves, and they decided to stay in one place and rebel against God. This is the age of what's called family. Uh, basically, that God brought Abraham. This is Moses, and then the first advent, the cross. This is the church age, and this is the tribulation age. And so God deals with different people through different times. And again... In general, I think biblically you can see that. But now what some people have done is said, well, God dispenses his grace in different ways, meaning different people are saved in different ways. And then, again, this is the way I learned about dispensationalism, and I thought, well, that's not what I believe. So they would say, like, for instance, Noah, how were people saved in Noah's day? Well, they obeyed their conscience. Well, God did give us a conscience, and it was before the law, but that's not how people were saved. Uh, what about in the time of Abraham? Abraham 
was saved by believing God about Isaac. What about in the Mosaic time? They were saved by sacrifices. Now again, that's not what I believe. Because if you follow this logically, then you have to say, like some people have said, that those in the tribulation are saved in a different way as well. And so that's one extreme. Noah wasn't saved by human government. Uh, he, I, uh, Moses, nobody was saved by sacrifices or keeping the law. And I think Paul makes that pretty clear in Romans chapter 4. So now we do believe that God worked in different ways, but not in salvation. God worked in different ages through human history and different people groups. He worked with Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses and Israel and the church. And that's all true. But it's not as neat and tidy as some people make it out to be. Um, now, some people then have said, well, uh, then it must be what people believed about Jesus. And you've heard, or you've heard this maybe before. Those in the Old Testament look forward to the cross and we in the New Testament look back to the cross. And again, that sounds right, except they didn't know anything about the cross. I mean, they had little snippets, right? But even Isaiah 53 was written in 800 BC. I mean, that 800 years, those people maybe knew a little bit more about it. But let me ask you a question. By the time that Jesus came around, was there an expectation that Jesus would die on the cross? Not by most. Okay, so this wasn't something that was well known. The people in the Old Testament couldn't have looked forward to Jesus dying on the cross and the Messiah because they didn't know very much about it. You say, well, how were they saved? The same way we're saved. This is a weird thing to say. Um, we are saved by grace. Okay? We're not saved by Jesus' death. Now, we are saved by Jesus' death, but what specifically about Jesus' death is what saves us? The kindness that God showed in his grace and what Jesus did by dying for us was doing for us what we could not do, which is what grace was. But how did we get grace? Well, Ephesians 2, verses, verse 8 tells us, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Okay? It's always been by grace through faith. Right? God is always saved. How did Noah get saved? It was the kindness of God, God doing for Noah what he could not do for himself, and he accepted it by faith. How? He built a, a, a boat. Building the boat didn't save him, just like your prayer didn't save you, just like the sacrifices didn't save the Israelites, but it was God's grace that saved, and they accessed that grace by faith. It's always been grace through faith. And so, and that's the thing that people get wrong, I think. And I was taught that. And I, the more I read the Bible, I'm like, that just doesn't seem right. I don't understand how God can say you're saved by sacrifices and then go to in Hebrews and say the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins. It's either one or the other, right? It's always been by grace. And, the, and what they understood was different. Noah, Jesus, God didn't come to him and say, now, do you believe, Noah, that Jesus who is not born yet, will die on the cross for your sins. What's a cross? You know, what does that even mean? No, but what God said was, I promise that if you will believe me, I'll save you. Not just, again, physically, but also spiritually. And I think all the times that you see people that acted in faith, the faith was there because they loved God and the kindness of God was already in, in them. So um, there's a, a big difference then between what we call dispensationalism and what some have called themselves covenant theology, okay? And the idea is covenant theology says uh, there's only two covenants. There's not so many dispensations like Larkin said. There's only two covenants. There's the old covenant and the new covenant, okay? And, and the big difference between covenant and dispensationalism is Israel, okay? Right now, as we stand in 2020, who are God's people? Jewish and us. Yeah, whosoever. Whosoever. <laughs> <laughs> so this this is a hard thing because the covenant covenant people that believe in covenant theology said that God is done with Israel. I read this week in Isaiah, in Isaiah forty eight or forty nine or somewhere in there that God wrote Israel a bill of divorcement. So he is done with them. They are no longer God's people. 
All the promises in the Old Testament belong to the church. All the things in the Old Testament are about the church. They're all written for the church. The Old Covenant is gone. The New Covenant is here. We are now Israel. God doesn't care about genetic Jews at all. So let's stop supporting Israel. Let's stop saying, stop saying that the land is theirs. Let's stop all of that because we believe in a new covenant. That's the idea. And again, this is very, very popular, especially in Calvinistic circles. Um, but also the Roman Catholic Church believes that they're the new Israel. Um, there are a lot of different splinter groups um, that believe that God's done with Israel. And now we, we are God's people. Now, are we God's people? Yes. yes. In the same way as Israel. No. Does God care about Israel? Uh, let's say this. Does God care about genetic Jews who do not know Jesus more than genetic Gentiles who do not know Jesus? Yes. Yeah. As a people, he does. Now, again, did Christ die for all of them? Yes. But... God's people are still the Jews, and he's still going to work with them. And that's important for what we're going to talk about tonight. This, it seems like introduction, and it is, but it's foundational introductionism. So there's another big word for you. Um, it's important that the big difference between dispensationalism and covenant is who is Israel, and how does God deal with Israel? That's important. And we say as, as dispensationalists, I'm putting that in air quotes, dispensationalists, that God has dealt with different people in different ways, and we don't believe that we are the fulfillment of all of God's promise to Israel. We believe that God is still going to grant those promises. Now, again, the way that you look at that is going to color the way that you interpret Scripture, the way that you look at the millennial reign of Christ. We've talked about this already, but it's important to note that what you believe about Israel is important, because if, if the church really is the new Israel, then what we're going to talk about tonight is irrelevant. Right? It's a worldview. You've got to put your glasses on and look at it in this way. And you have to make a decision. Is God done with Israel or not? Is it the church and not Israel or not? And so you have to make those decisions. Um, and so we, we admit that we are right now in a time of hiatus where God is dealing primarily with the church, secondarily with Israel. But whereas before Christ it was only Israel, now it's secondarily Israel, primarily the church. Eventually, we believe it'll turn back to only Israel. Now, again, not saying Gentiles can't get saved, but in the Old Testament, could Gentiles get saved? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, so it's not going to be different. And it's still going to be Christ that saves. Um, and that's another thing with dispensation. The more people hack up the word of God, they call it rightly dividing, but when you tear up the word of God into itty bitty little dispensations where the rules are different every 10 years, then you're not really being a good exegete of the scriptures. You're, now you're just wading into man's territory. So when people ask me, are you a dispensationalist? I'm like, not really. Oh, are you a covenant theologian? No, not really. I do believe that God dealt with different people at different times, and I do believe that, the Isra that Israel and the church are different and separate. And I guess if that makes me a dispensationalist, then I am one, but I'm not. Because whenever you get man's ideas, it just gets very messy. And so let's not mess with it. Anyway, so with this view, let's, let's look at a timeline. Um, now, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm going to use this scale of 1 to 10. 10 means that we're fairly sure this is what it means. There's broad acceptance among different Christians that this is probably true, most likely true, or absolutely true. 10 would be like absolutely true. 9 is like probably one would be, this is Josh Hahn's opinion, and you know my opinion in a dollar will get you something out of the vending machine, okay? I'm just telling you, I don't know, the, more, the way I think about it, it could be this. It's not dogma at all, and please don't write a book saying the things that Josh Hahn said, okay? So there's a lot that we don't know. There's a whole lot that we don't know, and remember to be gracious. Now, again, I'm going to try to use that scale as we go along. I'll probably forget, but that's the scale I'm, I have in my head, okay? So... Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. This is where the whole thing starts, I believe. Daniel 9. I'm hesitant to ask, but before we get into this, are there any questions about covenant versus dispensationalism or dispensationalism? 
I, I'm, I'm only hesitant because I don't want to get bogged down in it, but if you have a, a question that you feel like would help you understand the rest of this, I'd rather you ask it. Okay, all right. Feel free to ask. If you, uh, I don't mean to intimidate you. I don't, sometimes I phrase questions like, please don't ask, but I'm not asking that. I'm just, yeah. All right, so Daniel chapter 9. Now, the context of Daniel 9 is that Daniel is praying for the end of the 70 years of Jeremiah's captivity. Jeremiah said 70 years um, of captivity, and Daniel, doing math and realizing when Jeremiah said that, is like, oh, the 70 years are almost over. Oh, and so even though God promised he would, Daniel's praying, God, would you fulfill your promise? Would you give us a, an opportunity to go back to the land? That's what da So he's praying. And then um, Gabriel comes and, and talks to him. And so let me, let me just read verse number 21 on. Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Okay, now the, the following one, two, three, four, five, four verses um, are explanation of what Daniel was praying about and, and giving him some understanding about the end times, okay? So he says, verse 24, of 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the Prince that shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate. until Even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, now there's a lot in there. Yeah. So let's unpack it a little bit. Okay, first of all, just right off the, get, right off the bat... Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Okay, so right from the get-go, who are we talking about? Jews. Jews, Israel, and Jerusalem. Okay, good. Now that's important. So the whole 70 weeks, whatever that is, we'll look at that in a moment. Whatever that is, that has to do with Israel. Okay, it has to do with Israel. Unless you believe, of course, that God forgot all about Israel and this is all church then I don't know what you're going to do with this. But he's talking to Daniel. This is for your people. God is working with the Jewish people. So these 70 weeks, whatever that is, are for them. He's working to accomplish six things. Um, finish the transgression. Make an end of sins. And to make reconciliation for iniquity. Now you could think at this point, well, that's just meaning that their 70 years of captivity are done and God is just bringing them back into the land. Maybe. But let's look at the other thing. And to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now that has not yet happened. Right? So we are talking about something that is yet future. Plus, Jesus said in Mark 13, when you see the abomination of desolation, which means that it was yet in the future even for him. Okay? So this, is a not, this was not just all fulfilled when all the Jews went back and built the temple and built the wall. There's something more that's going on here, okay? Now, what he says is 70 weeks. Now, when we say week, we think what? Seven days. That's like the only way that we think of week. The word in the Hebrew is actually, though, 70 sevens. Okay? For them, you could say seven. I'll see you in a seven. And, and you would mean a week. But, of course, a seven means a lot of different things. Literally, this means 77s, okay? So seven what? 
Well, I have a little math chart here. If the 77s is 77 days, then we're talking a year and a third, uh, one and a third years. If Daniel's writing in 539 BC, then this would have been 538 BC. What happened in 538 BC? We have no idea. <laughs> nothing really. I mean, there was nothing there. It was, Cyrus hadn't even made the declaration for the people to go back yet at this point because it was still two or three years away when Daniel started praying, realizing that the Jeremiah's weeks were getting closer. Okay, um, So what if it's, instead of 70 weeks, it's seven sevens, like seven weeks, 77 weeks. Well, that would be, again, doing some math, uh, nine and two-fifths or round up to a third years. Uh, nine, so nine years from 930, 539, that gives us a, around 529 B.C. What happened in 529 B.C.? Nothing, really. Nothing that we know of. Nothing significant. Okay. So what, what about months? What if we said 77s? What's the seven, seven what? Well, let's say months. So if it's that true, then that's 40 and a third years. And that would put us at 499 B.C. Again, what happened in 499 B.C.? Nothing that we really know of, okay? Now, it could then be 77s or 77 years. And if that's true, again, not so quick math, 490 years. And that puts us around 48 BC from the time of Daniel's writing in 539 BC, okay? So now, again, no matter how you, if you move this, there, there's not a whole lot happening. And as we look at what's in this passage, I'm going to make the case that it should be... Um, 77s of years, right? Years, not days, weeks, months, or decades. I and mean, if you do put decades in, that's 4,900 years, and that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> we have no idea. Maybe all of this is yet future a couple thousand years from now. I'm not sure, but um, I don't think so. Uh, so the best idea is, is that it's years. Now, again, why is that true? Well, the rest, if, if it's not years, the rest of these wouldn't have even covered Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes, who was, I mean, the one that's talked about quite a bit in Daniel, uh, the, the prototype of the Antichrist, all of what he did happened uh, a few hundred years after this. So anything but that doesn't even touch Antiochus Epiphanes, right? You have to put years in to get to any significant happenings in the Jewish in the Jewish faith, in the Jewish uh, history. Um, I also believe it's seven because uh, usually I have a nice little thing here. Um, okay, there, so here. Uh, two, Revelation has halfway points that refer to years. Now, Caleb, you asked this last week, and so this is my answer. There's a few different places in Revelation where it, it gives us an idea of, and again, it doesn't ever say seven years. Revelation never says seven years. But there are at least two references to something. So this one here in Revelation 12, verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she had, hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Do the math. What's a thousand two hundred and three score days? Well, it's three and a half years. Okay? Now, the other one here, the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and thy holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. How much is forty and two months? Three and a half years. Okay, so three and a half years. Why three and a half years? That's an arbitrary number unless it's important. Okay? Unless God's saying something about the time of the great tribulation. Now, again, I believe then that the best understanding of 77s is that it's talking about years. Now, really great scholars agree with that. And that's why I can put this at like a seven. But of course, if you're not a premillennialist, then you'd put this at like a two. <laughs> so this is part of the thing I'm talking about that we have to wrestle with. Because all it says is sevens. All it says is weeks. And if you just said 70 weeks, then again, you're only 40, what, what did I say? Nine and a half years away from where Daniel wrote. And that's just not enough time for anything to really happen. Okay, So what's he talking about here? Oh, the rest of the stuff didn't happen in nine years, 40 years, but we get pretty close when we say years. Now, um, the other thing then to talk about is this. Um, da -da -da -da. Okay.
Okay, I have a few other verses here. Um, Revelation 13, 5. Um, Revelation 12, 14. To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Now the idea of, the phrasing there is odd. And so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a weak argument. But the phrasing is a time and times and a half a time. Which would again be, it indicate three and a half years. No, it doesn't say three and a half years. So you could say, well, that's not what it means. And maybe it doesn't. It's just coincidental that 1260 days, 42 months, a time, a times, and a half a time are all used in the same book to talk about a time that we believe is seven years. Okay, I just think that's, and again, Revelation 12, verse 7 uses that same phrase over in Daniel, excuse me, I said Revelation 12, 7, Daniel 12, verse 7, I heard a man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. Okay, so again, there's that phrase again, time, times, and a half. And I think the best way to understand that is three and a half years. Okay, now, when, excuse me, when, what's the beginning? What's, according to this passage, what is the beginning of these 70 weeks? Not from right now. Now, again, I said Daniel's writing at 539, and this is only a couple of years, but what does this actually say? It says, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Okay, that's the beginning of the 70 weeks. When did that happen? Well, there's a few different options of when it might have happened. It might have been in 538 when uh, the temple and Jerusalem were, uh, when Cyrus told them they could go back home. It could have been in 521 when Darius uh, reaffirmed Cyrus's decree. It could have been in 458 when Artaxerxes gave permission to Ezra to proceed. But I think the best understanding is in 444 BC, when Artaxerxes told Nehemiah to go back and build Jerusalem. Before that, they had permission to build the temple. They could do some, but they didn't have real permission until 444 or 445 BC. So May 14th, 445 is when Artaxerxes told Nehemiah to go. We read about that in Nehemiah 2 verse 1. That is the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem and, and the temple. Okay? Um, so then, from there, what happened going forward? Now, notice in our passage, there was a division. It says, again, in verse number 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem under the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. You read Nehemiah, and the wall was built in troublous times, wasn't it? It was hard for them with uh, Sanballat and Tobiah fighting them. That was when the wall was built and it was in troublous time. And it took them just a little while, but within 40 years, uh, it, the whole temple and everything was built. So that's 49 years. That's the first seven. Seven sevens, 49 years is when it was built. And then you had 62 sevens, right? So 62 and seven is 69. Now, let's, again, do some math. What happens then at the end? We'll do the math in a little bit here. But what happens at the end of 69 weeks, according to this passage? Now, look again in verse number 24. 70 weeks of inter... No, excuse me. Verse 25. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, 445, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the, unto the Messiah, the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Okay, so what happens at the end of 69 weeks? The Messiah is, comes. Okay, the Messiah comes. Verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Okay, so what happened at the end of 62, or 69, if you put them together, weeks? The Messiah died. Jesus died, okay? Now here's, here's again, Something in it, and you can accept this or not. I think it's compelling. I'll put a six on it to be gracious, but really, if you ask me in private, it's more like an eight. Anyway, um, but if you take 69 years times 
times the Jewish calendar, which is 360 days. Okay, we, we go with the solar calendar, 365.24 days, but really the Jewish calendar went 360, and then they'd have a leap day every, every so often. Okay? If you take that, though, that is really 173,880 days. Now, if you convert that back to solar, using the Roman time, again, when we believe that Jesus lived on the earth, that brings us to 8032, right around the same time that Jesus Christ was killed. Okay, so from the going forth of the commandment in Nehemiah 445 to 8032, that's the 69 weeks. And then the Messiah was cut off. Okay, and then it says, the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and under the end of the war, desolations are determined. What's that talking about? Titus, destroying the temple, right? So at that moment... Something happened. Something changed. So that's the crucifixion of Jesus. And Luke 21, 24, this is interesting what Jesus said. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until when? The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That's why I believe that God, his focus on Israel was until then. And when the temple was destroyed, his focus then went to the church or Gentiles. Now again, that's not to say that Jewish people can't get saved, but it's a time of the Gentiles. We're still, I believe, five, six, seven, uh, in the time of the Gentiles now, right? And, and the time of the Gentiles isn't going to end until we don't know when. But when the time of the Gentiles is done, then comes that dangling week that's out there. Because it was 69 to Messiah. He was cut off. There was an interim there, a generation, the destruction of the temple. And now we're waiting for that 70th week. That's seven years. Okay? Um, so thus then we're in the church age or the time of the Gentiles. And yet, so the 70th week is yet future for us. We don't have it yet. Uh, we're still waiting for it. Okay, so that's why when I've said it over the last few weeks, the tribulation or Daniel's 70th week, that's what I'm talking about. Now again, I find it compelling. I find it to be a pretty easy way to put together all the different passages and what it's talking about. Other people have different interpretations. You say, what are they? Well, I don't know. I haven't studied them all very heavily, and that's why I'm not ready to do a Sunday school yet. So what will begin... The 70th, it's supposed to be 70th week, according to this, verse number 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Again, one week, the last week, seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So what begins the 70th week? According to this, if you believe that he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, it's talking about the Antichrist signing a peace covenant with Israel, then that is what begins the 70th week that we're waiting for. Who's the Antichrist? We don't know. When, how will he appear on the scene? We don't know. Will we be able to see him as a leader in Europe or wherever? I don't know. I don't know. But that, his signing of it, is what begins the 70th week. Now, I also believe that before he does that will be the rapture. I'm, I'm okay with saying, well, I'm okay with saying that the rapture might happen. There's a time of chaos for a little while, and because of all that chaos, then the Antichrist has to sign a treaty. So, is the rapture what starts the 70th week? I don't think so. I don't think biblically you can make that case. Biblically, what the case says is he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. But I personally believe, for, that the rapture is, it will happen before even the Antichrist signs this. Why do I believe that? Because um, I don't have a reason to believe it. I just do. You know, I, I believe that... Uh, that that whole period of the 70th week is, again, a time of 
God's dealing with Israel. It's a time of wrath. And those are things that don't include us as a church, that will be raptured out of, out of here before then. Okay, so uh, the covenant is a promise, a promise of peace, a peace treaty with Israel. Uh, and again, will we be around for this? I don't, I don't think so. So you say, well, if there is, now this is total speculation, but if, just logically, if there is a covenant with Israel, what does that imply? Well, it implies that there was war, there was fighting, there was trouble with Israel. Well, what would cause that? Again, we have no idea, but I can speculate. I can give you my one. Um, millions of people disappearing off the face of the earth. The fall of America. You know who our number one uh, recipient of foreign aid is right now? Israel. You know who number two is? Egypt. Why do we give so much money to Egypt? So they'll keep their peace treaty with Israel. <laughs> we give a lot of money to the Middle Eastern countries so they'll, they'll keep off of Israel. So what happens if America falls? I mean, why is it that all those Arab nations haven't attacked Israel? Well, they have a good army, but it's only Israel. I mean, Amy and I were there. You could stand at the top of Mount Carmel and see the borders on either side. It's not a very big place. It's amazing that they've been able to stay in a place. I mean, again, I get God. I'm not saying that, that America is the sole reason why Israel is still in the earth. Obviously, it's God. I'm just saying that right now, God's using America to do that. And if there's fighting with Israel, I wonder, personally, if that means that America is not in the picture anymore. And I know people have said, I, I see America in prophecy. And maybe you do. Maybe it's there. I just don't see it. Um, and I think we as Americans get too focused on America has always been the savior. I think this last week and the last few weeks have, have shown really how vulnerable we are. I'm not setting dates. I'm not trying to get anybody terrified. I'm just saying this is how I see it could happen. Why there needs to be a covenant. Why there needs to be this, this peace treaty. Uh, the Antichrist may be revealed before the rapture and no covenant yet. We don't know. But Revelation is a heavily Jewish book. Um, and again, I think that's one of the evidences that the rapture will occur before the events of Revelation. Because as you read through the book of Revelation, it starts with the churches. But then it, the rest of the book is really all about Israel. Uh, it's a very Jewish book, Revelation is. It's not a very Gentile book. And so that, I believe, is, is one of the proofs for the fact that, Israel, that the church is, is gone. I have some other proofs that I'm not going to get into tonight. One of them I mentioned last week about he that will... Let who, he who let it will let until he'd be taken out of the way. I'm not sure. Some people believe that the battle of Gog and Magog, talked about in Ezekiel 38, will be the thing that starts this tribulation, that there'll be a war, and then the rapture will happen. But again, I don't, I don't know if you could prove that either way. Uh, it seems to me from Revelation 20, verse 8, that the battle of Gog and Magog happens at the end of the millennial reign. So um, I'm not sure what Ezekiel 38 is talking about. It's very interesting, though, that the major players in Ezekiel 8 are major players today with a few different names. So what will happen during this 70th week? Again, Larkin, um, but it's very hard to see. So I'm going to break this down a little bit for you. But um, this, if you've read Revelation, then you kind of get this idea of what this is. The Antichrist, in verse 27, will break the covenant in the middle of it, in the midst of it, somewhere in the middle. Again, three and a half years is a pretty good place to start because there's a reference to that. Uh, at some point in the middle, and he'll start oppressing the Jewish people. He'll stop sacrifices. We know from Second Thessalonians that he'll go into the temple and declare himself God. That we know from Revelation that the false prophet is going to set up a, some kind of image or statue that's going to make people worship the beast. He's going to get um, a mark. He's going to make everyone take a mark. Um, and so that's going to be, again, this is when the, the first little while of the tribulation won't seem so, so bad. And then it'll get really bad. And so it's just uh, something to understand. Um, now this means, this entails then that there's going to be a temple rebuilt, right? So if, if all the things we're talking about here... How can he cause the sacrifices to cease? Aren't they ceased right now? Well, that implies at some point then, I think, that there's going to be, at some point in the future, a, um, 
a temple built. And I, I was do, doing a little bit of digging yesterday on the, uh, and we didn't get to see it when we were in Israel, but the, the um, Temple Institute, where they have priestly vestures. They have, I saw a picture of the menorah that was donated, pure gold, uh, that they're going to use it's under glass case right now. They're going to use it in the temple. They're waiting for it. Um, and people are pouring money. Americans are pouring money into the Temple Institute so that this can happen. No, I don't know why. <laughs> you know, but that's what they want to do, and that's fine. Maybe they want to be a part of that. I don't think, I don't, honestly, don't give any money to the Temple Institute. <laughs> you know, uh, sure, it would be neat, but we're not going to be here. Okay, I really don't think so. But at some point, the temple is going to be rebuilt. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. Let me give you my one. At some point... <laughs> The, that mosque that's on there has to go. No, I know. There's been speculation of, well, maybe it's right next to it. Well, the Arabs own that land too, okay? So there's no getting around it. Something has to happen with the Arab control of that temple mount in order for there to be a temple rebuilt. I don't think it will take very long for them to rebuild a temple at all. It seems like they're ready for this to happen. And again, I don't know anything about that as far as when it's going to happen, anything like that, but I know it will be there. Um, I know that when we were in Israel, they said that they found a red heifer after hundreds of years, I think thousands of years. Now they have a red heifer, and they're pretty sure this is the one. They're looking at all the hairs. And what, what did he say? It was like, you can't have two more than, it doesn't have to be perfectly red, but you can't have two not red hairs together. That's what makes it a red heifer. Is that what he said? Something, Something like that. that. Yeah. So, but they are almost sure that they found it. This is what our Jewish guide said in Israel. So what, what does the red heifer mean? Well, the red heifer, they, they burn it and they use the ashes to sanctify the temple. And they haven't had one for 2,000 years. And now they have one. Okay, What does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't mean anything as far as... It just means that we're getting closer, right? The, so they have the ashes. They still have to do something with the temple mount, right? They still have to do something with building the temple, the Antichrist still has to come on the scene. And I don't. the Bible doesn't explain how all that stuff happens. It's just very interesting to talk about that with the red heifer and things, okay? So the events of Revelation, and this is important to know, are not necessarily chronological. Now, there are some things that are chronological. Obviously, if it says the first trumpet, second trumpet, third trumpet, that's a time stamp, Right? What I'm saying, I guess, is it doesn't say two and a half years into the 70th week or three and a quarter years into the tribulation, this is what happens. Or how close do these things come on one another? It could be that none of this stuff starts until the three and a half year mark. I don't know. It could be that some of these things that happen, happen in succession over a long period of time. I mean, only have seven years, but... We, we don't know anything about that. And we as Americans love time, you know? Give me the timeline. I want to know exactly month by month what's happening during the tribulation. And God just didn't give any of that to us, okay? So let's do kind of an overview of Revelation. Revelation 1 through 3 is present time. John, he's writing to actual churches. And again, I know that some people have allegorized that and said, well, each of these churches represent different ages. It's very interesting. And I, and I, I can take some of that. It's just not... That's just not what the Bible says. And so it's hard for me to jump on that. But they, at the very least, it was a letter to actual churches. Revelation 4 or 5 is a scene in heaven. So this is what something that the, Re the book of Revelation keeps doing. It goes from heaven to earth. Heaven, earth. Heaven, earth. And you get little glimpses of what's going on in earth and how people are reacting to this. So chapter 4 and 5, this is the scene in heaven. They're preparing for the tribulation. The, the, the scroll is there. And remember, who is worthy to open the scroll? The lamb slain. And he takes the scroll and it's got seven different seals on it. And so Revelation chapter 6 are the seven seals of the scroll. And every time the lamb pulls back one of them, something happens on the earth. The first seal is a conquering king. And uh, again, you, you can look there if you want, but I'm not really going to refer to anything. Um, the first one is a conquering king. I believe this isn't, some people have said this is talking about the Messiah, um, but the word that's used for crown here is a different word. And this one going through to kill, it seems like, again, at the beginning of the tribulation wouldn't be Christ. This is called the, this is the Antichrist. This is, the, this is what it talks about in, in Daniel chapter 9. 
the, the prince that will come in and destroy. So he's going to come in. And he's going to seem like to the earth a savior. The second seal is unrest. Uh, wars among the people. Mass killing and lawlessness. And again, aren't you glad we don't have anything like that nowadays? I mean, just how terrible would that be? What we're experiencing now, again, I know that there were race riots in the 70s. I wasn't around for them. But I understand that there were race riots in the 70s. Doesn't it seem worse this time around? Doesn't it seem like at least then you had some morality to turn back to, to appeal to? And now it seems like there's, there's nothing like that. Um, so, and again, am I saying that these riots are part of the tribulation? No, I'm just saying it's easy to see how it can be that people are just going to go on killing each other. I mean, again, just looking at the way people are treating each other now is, this is just a little taste. This is like 0.1% of what it's going to be like in this area of people turning against each other. The third seal are famines. Um, the, the three measures, uh, a measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of uh, barley for a penny. A penny was a day's wage, so a whole day's of wage for a sack of flour. I mean, famine, the food prices were going to be astronomical because of, obviously the more war you have, the more lawlessness. I mean, we've already seen food prices go up in the little bit that we've experienced in America with COVID and with the rioting. We've seen food, food prices really go up, right? So just imagine how bad it's going to be on a global scale. And especially if, again, if America's not in, the, in anymore, there's no... I mean, we feed a lot of the world. And if America's not here anymore, if, if all those transportation... If everything is shut down, you can see how there would be famine in the world. Um, fourth seal, genocide and mass death. Uh, wars. And it just, all it says is death. Um, uh, over a fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, hunger, death, and with the beasts of the earth. And that's interesting to me. Um, uh, the wild beasts, I, I think it indicates that the fear of man is going to be gone from animals. Right now, we tell animals, they'll leave you alone if you leave them alone. During the tribulation, it seems like that's not going to be the case. And again, just think about how terrifying that would be. How terrifying that would be. All those bears that are content to be out in the woods. <laughs> Less yeah. Right now already. Right. Yeah. So that just again, this is just one little aspect. If that were true across the world, where all the animals just decided, you know what, I'm not going to put up with this anymore. <laughs> Man's dominion doesn't mean anything to me. God's restraining hand is taken. I mean, just think about how much panic there. I mean, we're worried about murder hornets or whatever the murder wasp or whatever they're called. You know, and and let's talk about all the animals that can kill you. And all the restraint is gone. Just that alone would make the tribulation terrifying. And that's like a footnote. Yeah. Okay? So just think about that. Um, or don't. Um, the fifth seal is persecution against Christians. And I use the word Christian because um, there, how do people get saved in the tribulation? Well, we're after the cross. They have to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. And so these are believers. Not just the Jewish people because it says in... Uh, um, verse number nine, uh, they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Um, and uh, so, again, that's talking about born again believers, I believe. The sixth seal is an earthquake, an earthquake that causes major disasters. It'll cause the sun to be blocked out, uh, which is either, again, a dust cloud or atmospheric conditions. We know that the sun itself doesn't go black because later on it'll be so hot it'll scorch everything. But the way that we're perceiving the sun, There'll be, again, a dust cloud. There'll be pollution, maybe from the wars. I don't know. I, I did some reading on World War I a little while ago or some podcasts. And uh, even you know, just in World War I, there was so much smog and everything from the war that you couldn't tell if it was day or night. And so that has to be part of it. Um, the sun will be blocked out. The islands and the mountains will be moved. The terrain will change. There'll be fear among the people of the earth for God's wrath. Um, but they're not going to do anything about it. And, and then the seventh seal then readies the, for the blowing of the seven trumpets, which is in chapter 8. So that's all chapter 6. And this is all, again, scary thought, just preliminary. Again, we don't have any timeline with this. How long between the conquering king and the unrest and the famines? Well, we don't know. We just know that this is going to be what happens. And again, if you follow human history... 
this is the way that it, you have war, you have unrest among the people because there's war going on, there's fighting, you have famine, you have genocide and mass death, you have persecution against religion, again, and then God throws in these natural things that happen, okay? So this is just, this is the way we see the world going and it's going to be just intensified in the 70th week. Revelation chapter 7 is, uh, again, a scene in heaven, a ceiling of the 144,000, which very clearly are Jewish people, Jewish young males. The Jehovah's Witnesses can say up and down all they want that that's referring to believers, but you have to do a lot of twisting around, which the Jehovah's Witnesses don't mind doing. So they're, they're practiced at it. Chapters 8 and 9 are then the blowing of the trumpets. The first trumpet is a hailstorm with fire destroying one-third of all vegetation on the earth. And again, just think about that. First of all, just from a standpoint of the way things would look, but second, from food. Third, just from oxygen. I mean, how much, how much less oxygen is going to be on the earth because of all of this? Um, the second trumpet, there'll be, and it, what it says here is, um, and the second angel, in verse number eight, so chapter eight, verse eight, and the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. It doesn't say a great mountain was, but something like a great mountain was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. Sounds like a volcano. It sounds like, or, or uh, maybe another asteroid, or, or something that happens that makes the sea. And again, why turn to blood? I'm, I'm guessing because some of the sea creatures die, um, things like that. Um, or it takes on a blood-like quality. Again, we just don't know. But this mountain thing will kill one-third of the sea creatures and destroy one-third of the ships that are in the earth. The third trumpet is a meteor called Wormwood. Uh, that, when it hits the water, will poison one-third of the water. And again, I don't know all of what that is. I mean, if it's, if it's uh, coming to the earth and, it's, and maybe it hits in some way where particulates are put in the water, I, I don't know. But it's going to poison the, I, I believe, fresh water. The fourth trumpet, a third part of the sun, and the moon will be darkened again. So it's already dark, and now it's going to get worse. And again, you can imagine... Um, I, I'm again, I don't know, I wasn't around when Mount St. Helens erupted, but I understand that it was pretty hard to see the sun for a long time. If you've got a big meteor that comes and hits the earth and puts dust everywhere, and if there's already a volcano, you can imagine things would get pretty dark. Now again, I don't know about what it's going to be like in South America. I think all of this is really centered around Israel. So will it be a, glo a global thing? I don't know. I don't know exactly. Maybe all of that will be gone. They'll just be little pockets of people. I can't really answer all those questions. But um, I know from here, it says that, again, a third of the water will be poisoned. Um, a third of the sun, moon will be darkened. And then in the fifth trumpet, it's a release of what, the, what is described as locusts. But the locusts aren't like normal locusts. One, they look different. And two, they have a king over them. Um, this tells me that it's not literal locusts, but probably demons. So some kind of demonic influence is going to be unleashed on the world and they're going to be torment, uh, tormenting people. Now again, there have been all sorts of interesting theories about what it means that they had breastplates and the sound of their wings was the sound of chariots. Is that talking about helicopters? Is it talking about... We don't know. We have no idea. Uh, what's that? Drones. Drones, yeah. That very well could be. We have no idea. It's interesting to speculate. Um, again... I care this much because I'm not going to be here, but it's interesting to, to speculate on and think about. And the people that are going to be alive during the tribulation, this will be very much more clear to them what's going on. Um, this is the, for the end of the first of three woes. There's three woes throughout tri, tri, uh, Revelation. And this, then the fifth trumpet ends the first of the three woes. The sixth trumpet is a two million man army that kills one third of the people. Uh, a two million man army goes through with, with cavalry and just and kills one third of the people. And again, if you imagine this coming from the east, from China, not, not that hard to kill one third of the people as you march through India. There's already skirmishes uh, where? On the China-India border right now? Is that what's going on? So these are just rumors of wars. I'm, all I'm saying is it's not that hard to see. They have a two million man army. Yeah, yeah. I mean... 
even if I didn't know how to see this, I'm like, well, God tells the truth. But uh, it's not that, I mean, it's really not hard to see, no. So that then ends chapter 8 and 9. And chapter 10, again, goes back to heaven, a scene in heaven, a preparation for the rest of what happens. Revelation 11 is a little bit of a hiatus where it talks about these two witnesses. Now, who are the two witnesses? I'm not going to answer that question. I don't know. <laughs> but there's two witnesses that come and they bring miracles like Moses and Elijah did. And uh, they, they do all kinds of things and they, they testify for the Lamb. They're killed by the Antichrist. They're resurrected and then they go to heaven. And after that, there's an earthquake and, uh, and the seventh trumpet which is the end, then, of the second of three woes. Uh, the seventh trumpet prepares, then, for the vials. Uh, the seventh vial... Oops. Oh, okay. The seventh trumpet um, just prepares for the vials. Um, chapter 11, the two witnesses. Chapter 12 through 15 then it kind of takes a step away. 12 through 15 is not chronological. 12 through 15 then takes another step back and says, now let's look at this in kind of a panoramic way, in an overview. So chapter 12 is um, human history narrative of, of Jewish persecution. And again, I can say this with like a, a seven or an eight. I think when it's talking about the woman that gives birth to the man and the dragon coming, I think that's talking about the way that Satan has been persecuting Israel and will go after her heavily during the tribulation period, but God will um, protect her. Now, again, it says that there was um, an eagle that helped her, and some people have said, well, that's talking about America, but that's a bit of speculation. I don't know. There are probably some other countries that would be you know, qualified or described with an eagle, but I don't know. It would be great. I just don't think that's probably the way it's going to happen, but I don't know. Uh, chapter 13 talks about the person of the Antichrist, and again, it doesn't mean that the person of the Antichrist shows up after the seventh trumpet. It just means, I don't believe, it just means that this is now talking about the way he is. It can't be that he just shows up now because he's already killed the two witnesses, which came before the seventh trumpet. Chapter 14 is, are the saints and the preparation for the return of Christ. Again, not chronological, but an overview of the whole period. And chapter 15 is, again, a scene in heaven, praise to God and a preparation for the end. Now, as we look at the seven vials, it goes back and forth as you read it from earth back to heaven, earth, heaven, earth, heaven. And so, again, this is God now becoming involved in it. It's not just Satan being allowed to do whatever he wants. That was the first, the, the scrolls. Now it's... God coming down and preparing for this. So the first vial uh, soars on those with the beast's mark, unbelievers. The second vial is that the seawater becomes, and it says as blood, not blood, but as blood, so that every living thing in the, in the sea dies. Now again, I don't know what that looks like. If it's volcanoes, there's all of a sudden the sulfuric content of the water goes way up. Uh, there's somehow salt that gets in the water that kills all the sea life. But again, just imagine millions, billions of dead things floating on the surface or in the water, you know? You're not going anywhere. Um, and it's just the, the stench, everything would just be awful, death everywhere. Um, in the third vial, the, the fresh water then becomes, it doesn't say as blood, it says blood. Now again, what does that mean? I don't know. Can God make water turn into blood? Yeah. Well, <laughs> God can do anything he wants, but he's already shown that he can in Egypt, okay? So whether it's, Physically, like I think, or you can even say metaphorically, something, blood is not something that you can drink, okay? So whatever it is, the fresh water then becomes undrinkable for the people that are here during this time. The sun becomes scorching, and again, is that talking about an atmospheric opening? Uh, sun flares, we don't know, but there's something about the sun that becomes scorching, and then in the fifth vial, the sun goes dark. And again, this could be actually something with the actual sun, or it could be something with the atmosphere. We don't really know. The sixth vial seems unimportant, but it's actually very important. It's the Euphrates River drying up so that the world's armies can all march across and fight each other. Again, Israel is at a pretty strategic location between Europe, Asia, and Africa. It's right there. And Amy and I were there on Mount Carmel overlooking 
the valley of Megiddo or Armageddon in the Hebrew. And that is where the army is going to take place. Or that's where the battle is going to take place. When I was in high school, there was a movie that came out called Armageddon. Was it about a war in Israel? No, it was about an asteroid. And it's like... You, What's this about? You, yeah, you take that movie back. I never saw the movie, but you take that movie back and show Paul, and he's like, why are we talking about an asteroid? The ghetto is 36 miles that way. <laughs> you know. But that's, that's the way the world understands. Oh, it's ready for Armageddon. Well, Armageddon is a battle. It's a place. It's the Valley of Megiddo. So that's that's where all this takes place. And then in the seventh file, when the seventh file is poured out, uh, God says it's done, and a great earthquake topples the world's cities. All of them are flattened. And again, this is the end. And despite all of that, the people of the world, the armies of the world, still march to go kill each other. What is there to kill for? What is there to fight for? It doesn't matter. Again, I did... I listen to this podcast on uh, World War I, and they were fighting at the end for what? What were the Germans fighting for? What were the, what were the British fighting for? What were the Russians fighting for? It's not about freedom. Not even about a land grab at this point. It's just a kill. And that's the way it's going to be uh, in the end. Revelation 18 and 19 are, is the fall of Babylon. You say, what's Babylon? I have no idea. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, could be Rome... Could be the seat of the Antichrist. We don't know exactly. Uh, at some point in Revelation, it does say that the fall of ba that Babylon is the place where the Lord died. But um, the way that Babylon is described, I mean, Jerusalem has never been the merchant of America or of, of the world. And so we don't know exactly what Babylon is, but there's something religious to do with it, okay? And so there's, there's something about that. We, again, we don't know, but there's the fall of Babylon and the rejoicing or mourning over it. Chapter 19, again, we looked at this, is the return of Jesus Christ to the earth bodily and with us uh, will be with him. Revelation chapter 20 is the millennial reign of Christ physically on the earth and at the end, the judgment. Revelation 22, 21 and 22, the eternal state. Um, I wish I would have put this in here, but I, I thought about it. I should have put the picture of the Valley of Megiddo so you could see just how vast it was, just how huge this valley is and how strategic. There are mountains all around. I, I've been told that Napoleon was there and said, this is a perfect battlefield. Now, again, I don't, if, I'm, if that's an urban legend and I just passed it on, I apologize, but go ahead and look it up at some point. I was told that he was there and... He said this is a perfect battlefield. And so that I, I wish I could show you. I, I, I wish I would have put it on there. Maybe some other time we'll do a little series or I'll do a Sunday night or something where I can show you some of those pictures. But um, just an incredible thing to think about. Now that's the timeline. So that's what we're looking at. Now again, the only timeline that I really need to worry about is at some point, soon, Christ comes back and takes us with him. And we'll have zero warning. Amen. So all of what we talked about tonight, tonight is interesting and good. And obviously the Bible wants us to know about it. But there's so much that we can't know, that we don't know, that is, is not very easy to try to comprehend. It will become very clear for those in the tribulation. This will be a nice roadmap. Nice roadmap. That sounds very patronizing, doesn't it? Um, it'll be a great resource for them to know exactly what's happening and how long they have to, to uh, hold out. Any movie that you could watch, Left Behind or whatever, isn't going to come even close to what it's really going to be like. And all you, again, all you have to do is look at the news to see just a little, little taste about what it's like right now. Any questions that you have that I could answer? Well, when you were talking about that one part of, about the Antichrist that the rapture has to happen first, I think you're probably referring They were, because they were being persecuted and stuff, and they, they thought maybe he's coming right away. Yeah. And he Paul and explaining to him, um, for the, this is a Thessalonians, for the mystery of the thing does already work. Only he who now left will let until he be taken out of the way. Well, he can't come until he be taken out of the Antichrist. That's what it was, the Antichrist about when he, when we would know him or not know they're not going to know. And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of the ground. Yeah. At the end. Or in the tribulation anyway. But yeah. He, so we're not going to know until we're, he, he, meaning the Holy Spirit, which we have the Holy Spirit in, yeah. 
Yeah. Or taken out. And then the wicked one will be revealed. Yeah. They're going to look for something. <laughs> yeah. When the Christians are gone, they think, oh, we're bad now. When the Christians are gone, they go, man, I wish they had a few of those around now. And we're not going to be there. Right. And just think of how wicked. You see the way things are now. Just think when the Christians are gone. Right. Man. Yeah. That'd be ugly. Yeah. And the only reason I said I'm not sure is I, th I feel like that passage could either refer to he'll be revealed as the Antichrist, like we'll know who he is, or he'll be revealed at, at the midway point where he goes into the temple and proclaims himself as God. Right. So that, that has to happen first, right. even if it happens halfway through. So I'm, I'm always only hedging myself. No. I, I tend to think, again, that the rapture is going to happen before we ever know who the Antichrist is. Yeah. But the Bible doesn't come right out and say that specifically. But yours, that passage is as close as it comes to saying that. Yeah. Say. Yeah. yeah we, we won't have a clue. And I don't know when he shows up in there. I mean, it could be a lot of stuff, like you say, going on. Yeah. Before, well, we got to have some of it. And then they get all together. I mean, it could, but look how quick things happen in just a few months. Right. Since March. Yeah. I mean, the whole world. It's not just from here, it's everywhere. Yeah. It's got shut down. Yeah, so if, if there was some, and again, I, don't, I have no idea, but let's just pretend, the head of the UN, you know, some charismatic leader that were all the world leaders were just, oh, throwing themselves at him, and he's the savior, and we as Christians would be looking at him, it wouldn't shake my faith, you know, to, like, well, if, if that's the Antichrist, why are we still here? Maybe, maybe, well, it's okay if he's here, he's just not being revealed as the Antichrist right. yet, right. until we're out of the way. Which is again what I believe that passage is talking about. Yeah, Jake. Oh uh, yeah, it's kind of a question slash observation, but it's interesting at the very end, the seventh vial kind of flattens the cities, and I'm just wondering if you feel like that will play a part in kind of um, demolishing our, our way of technology reliance and stuff like that today, and it will kind of bring things back to a simpler time when the San Francisco's of the world and the Tokyo's of the world are flattened. I have to think that the power grid goes down at some point. I also don't know of any other time in the world where the world would have some kind of mark that would show whether they can buy or sell. That's, that's not, if it's not electronic, I don't know how you'd ever enforce that. Mm -hmm. But again, what do I know? I, I can only speculate that it seems like that. So, But if it's not electronic, I don't know what it would be. But yeah, I mean, that definitely... And again, we have no idea how far into the tribulation that all the cities are toppled, you know? Was it, I mean, with like three months left? We have no idea. And if it's that, then that could make a lot of sense, you know? But just imagine trying to communicate with the army with no electronics. I mean, what chaos. Yeah. And another, another thing, too, you know, that kind of relates to what Jake was saying is that um, these signs and wonders that the Antichrist is going to be doing and the image of the beast and whatnot is going to be seen by everybody. Yeah. The whole entire world is going to see this. Yeah. So without having that electronic and technology and stuff, I, you know, that wouldn't be possible. Yeah. Yeah. It seems I like... Because even like the first time I ever read Revelation, of course, I, I wasn't saved at the time, but, you know, someone says, wow, it's really, you know, blah, blah, and I'm like reading them like, it's going to be on TV or something, you know, I suppose. <laughs> right. But now, I mean, you can just see it and it's like in real time, you know. 18th century Christians are like, well, how'd that happen? Yeah. You know? Sorcery. Well, yeah. 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 Amy, I'll get to you next, Marlene. So the zeal that initiates the persecution of Christians, you would say that those Christians are people who got saved after the rapture, but before that zeal. Yeah. Which yeah. could be a very short period of time. I mean, it could be months or... Yeah. could be. Yeah. So, and would you say those are people who only heard the gospel for the first time in that period, like that strong delusion passage? Like, would those be people who just heard the gospel for the first time somehow during that time? It's hard to know how many, like, how many people in our community have actually heard the gospel or have heard it with comprehension. I think there are people that have heard it and not like outright rejected it. They're just like, okay, you know. So I feel like for people that have already rejected the gospel, that's where the strong delusion will be sent. But I don't think the people that just have heard the gospel and not been saved, they still, I think, would have a chance to be saved. But I don't, 
That's a that's a controversial passage. So there could be quite a lot of Christians, even in that short period of time, because I would think if if you said ten percent of Park Rapids is born again, I don't know. I mean, we're just throwing yeah. that out there. So if ten percent of us are gone, there must at least hopefully be thirty to forty percent who are familiar with biblical teaching, maybe, but not born again. Yeah, they went to a VBS or something. Right, and if all the, or they're in nominal churches. Yeah. Right. So if those people were all driven to their Bibles after the rapture, there could be quite a lot of Christians then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Marlene? I attended the, the Grace Baptist Church the six years while I was living in Arizona. Okay. And it was the, oh, the Grace Baptist Church, and we studied Revelation. And the mark of the Antichrist, to my understanding, what was stated there is the mark of the number 666. Right. And in the world today, in our earthly world today, what about these false? Prophets that we have today. Yeah. Yeah, they're making it a lot easier to reject the Word of God, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Caleb? Um, I was a little bit hazy on the math. So you probably got it. Um, with the 77 to the 70 years, so you're saying that the first, um, first seven sevens, the first seven. So like 49 years later, that's when they rebuilt the temple, Jerusalem. Right. About that. And then there were 62 sevens that went up to when they killed Christ. Right. Um, so that adds up to 69 sevens. I thought you said that um, the 77 is when you believe it's years. Okay, what, 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 what time is that? With the 77, if you're taking the sevens as seven years, um, what time did you say that added up to? Well, I, on its face, if you take just years, it's 490 years. But if you look at it the way that the Hebrews do and the Romans do and and change it, then it's about 8032. So you have to like convert it into a different calendar? Yeah. Now again, that might not be right, but it's, I think, pretty compelling. It's pretty amazing. And it's the only date, if those are actual weeks, actual times, it's the only thing that gets you to anything that's close to something that actually happened. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 to have a Jewish understanding Yeah. Yeah. So if he said 490, and we say, well, take that times 360, so that's however many Jewish years there are. But now, when we look at, like if you ask a Jewish person what year is it, they'll tell you it's 5,438 or whatever. Oops. Um, right? Because they're counting from the creation of the world, and they have a different way that they do things. But if you ask a Roman, how many years has it been, or how many years is that, he would say a different number. That's, that would take you to AD 32. Right? So it's the same number of days. It's just the way that you reckon the years. It wouldn't be 490 years from the Roman understanding. It would be 490 years from the Jewish understanding. How does that convert to the Roman understanding of time? Well, that would take you to... If you just convert it to days, AD 32. Does that make sense? No, I, I understand how you're getting it. It's just complicated. So what would the year it be? It is. Yeah. For the Jewish then, I mean, it would be 32. It would be what? For Jewish. I did this math last night <laughs> at 2 a.m. So asking me to do math now, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, it would be like 
Well, okay, so just think about 490 years, take away 444. Days? Years. Years. Oh, I mean, yeah. That's 50. 46, 47, because there's actually no 0 AD. Right. So uh, AD 47 or 48. Oh, yeah. First century oh, yeah. Israel, they weren't like, this is 8021. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's all after the fact. It's all after the fact. Yeah, they wouldn't have known that, but from a year standpoint. Yeah. Evelyn? So, what happens to all the people who are still alive but are living? That's a good question. It, see, so, it seems like as you read through, I, so the question was for those of you online, what happens to all the people that are still alive? Uh, Armageddon. So now, all the people that are at actually the battle of Armageddon will die. They'll be all judged by Christ. But of course, there'll be people living in, you know, if it happen, the battle happens in Israel, obviously, there'll be people living in Bulgaria and in New Moscow Zealand. and what? New Zealand. New Zealand and things like that. So what happens to all those people? And it, it, the Bible doesn't come right out and say, so this is a two. Maybe a three. But as you read through Isaiah, when it talks about, and I, I don't have the exact reference in, in, in front of me. I think it's like Isaiah 11, somewhere in there. But it's talking about, that's the passage where it talks about the lion laying down with the uh, calf and the wolf with the lamb. And then it says, uh, so it's kind of describing these paradise conditions. And it says later, if a person dies at the age of 100, they'll be considered a young man, a child. Okay, so... Again, this is just speculation of things you have to do. Okay, if that's literal, if that's literal, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's going to be paradise conditions on the earth. It means that people are going to be living a long life again, just like they were before the flood, which again tells me that there were paradise conditions before the flood. And I think there's going to be paradise conditions during the millennial reign of Christ. He'll change the atmosphere again. He'll make all things new on the earth during that time. It'll be a time of, of great, it'll be, I mean, mirror opposite of the tribulation but people will also be dying so it's not talking about heaven it's not talking about the eternal state where there's no more death people will be dying but they'll be dying at at old ages so what does that tell us then well some people then who were alive at the end when christ comes back will live on and have children into the tribulate into the millennial reign of christ now i would say again believers those are people that got saved some point in the tribulation and they and their children moved into the millennial kingdom and reigned with Christ. Now, the Bible doesn't come right out and say that. So that's just, that's why you say speculation. And that's kind of an aha point for some post-millennialists. Ah, what about all the people in the millennial kingdom? And I'm like, well, that's not that hard to think that some people would have survived and lived on. I mean, we're dealing with 7 billion people on the earth right now and he said he's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron, so I just assumed that the ones living, you know, the ones that didn't die during the during Armageddon and all that, on the earth with all the plagues and everything going on, will have the, you, they'll finally have the utopia, but Christ will be <laughs> ruling and reigning. Yeah. And then at the end of that, you know, a, for a thousand years, everything's hunky dory, but there's, he still left Satan out. Well, these people get a chance to, who are you going to follow, you know? Yeah. And, and there's, for some reason, there's a lot of them that go Satan's way. That, and then he's, he's taking, for a little season, that's the question I want to ask. What is a little season? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say. Adam, how, how long will it take for people to follow Satan? Yeah. Well, how long did it take Adam and Eve? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, how long were they in the garden before they were know. like, yep. Yeah. A week? I mean, who knows? Yeah, long, yeah. yeah. I mean, long enough for there to amass an army against Christ. Yeah, I would, I would say it'd be more than a, a year or two, a couple of years or something. Yeah. And then, then he just took them off and said, Oh, yeah, let's open the books and get, get that part going. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So. We don't know exactly, but when you take all those things into account, if those are really talking about the paradise conditions during the millennial reign, which have not happened yet, 
So when does it happen? You either spiritualize it or say it's physically going to happen. If it's physically going to happen, when? Well, the millennial reign of Christ is the best option. So I think people will still be dying. I don't. We won't, obviously. Right. Uh, and you know, so we'll be ruling and reigning with Christ again in new bodies. What that looks like, what that's like, I have no idea. No idea. But we'll be with Christ for a thousand years on the earth, and then, yeah. Well, the soil has got to look at what it was like. Yeah. Just appear right there. Yeah. But then it handled me. It yeah. Still, you know, it wasn't a ghost. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Anybody else? I have one more question, because I want to get settled in my mind. Okay. What does the number six, six, six mean to you? Yeah, I, I mean... Is it satanic? Uh, well, the Bible doesn't say exactly. I have heard from others that six is the number of man, and so... That 666 is Antichrist. This is the rule of man without God. And this is just how terrible things go without and God. The, anti, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and Satan, it's like, kind of like the Trinity, like a, the 777, you know? I mean, a yeah. number of perfection. Satan's not that. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I've heard, but the Bible never comes out and says. Not really. It's it just the number of a man. Yeah. But you're able trying to express in the Baptist church in, it, in Arizona was when tribulation comes, there are going to be Antichrist people that are going to come to you and, and want to put the Mark 6 6 on you. Yeah. And you will not accept it because you're, you're, you belong to. Right, yeah. Um, it seems like, uh, so it seems like there were some questions about, like, the, uh, you know, getting a chip or something like that. Is that going to be a bad thing? Well, again, I see how the Antichrist could use something like that to make it so that you can't buy food or anything. Does that mean that if you get chipped that you're taking the mark of the beast? I don't think so. Am I going to get chipped? I don't like smartwatches. I mean, I don't do banking on my phone, so that shows you how much I, trust I have of that stuff. I don't. But I could get chipped, whatever, and not worry about it because I, what I feel like the mark of the beast is, it's actually an allegiance. It's a, it's a religious decision to worship and honor the beast as God. And a believer would never, ever do that. A believer would never... Take that willingly. Now again, so it's not going to be a trick like, oh no, oh no, I was just doing this for the money and now you're telling me after the fact that it's a religious thing? That's not really going to happen. There's going to be something that's very clear that you have to take this number, this mark or whatever, so that you can, again, pay homage to the Antichrist. That number could be rather frightening. It could, yeah. Anybody else? I was just going to say the reason they have it on either on your forehead or in in your palm of your hand or your hand or whatever because if you don't have any arm you have to use your forehead you, you're always going to have a head <laughs> right <laughs> you can go about a hand but you can always have, you always have to have a head yeah <laughs> you can be unarmed but was, you can't do it without a head unless you're in Congress anyway. 